არის რეცეპტის ეგრეთებული ბიძალა, მუსკემიის კონცეფცია. აა იმუშავა თუ არა ამ კონცეფცია, მუშაობს თუ არა, ცდილობს თუ არა ისეთი ამბიოს ბიძალა, თუ მისი ერთადერთი ახალანი არის ხესი ძალის გამოყოფა, მეზობლებს და სხვა ამოცნობის პროგრამების ჩვენ ამ დისკუსიის მოდერატორი დღეს არის საქართველოს პრეზიდენტის შეველი საგარეო პოლიტიკის საკითხებში დიდი მადუბოე გაფანტიც ახლოს ხელში მოძიებაზე. So let me introduce our distinguished speakers. Uh, it was my great pleasure to uh, that we have here today Mr. David Setter, welcome to Georgia. Uh, David is a former Moscow correspondent of the Financial Times of London and is the author of three books on Russia and the director of the documentary film. Uh, Russia is a very ideological country. Uh, we know this, of course, uh, because the ideology that Russia accepted uh, and imposed on uh, the former uh, countries, the, the, the countries of the former Soviet Union, was a holistic, universal uh, ideology which attempted to explain absolutely everything. Uh, once you uh, mastered this ideology, you were no longer in doubt about anything. You had the answers to every question. Uh, but the ideology which ruled in Russia up until the fall of the Soviet Union, more or less, in the last few years it was, of course, discredited, uh, was not intentionally a device for a small group of people to enforce their domination over the over millions of others. It, of course, worked out that way. But it began as a theory which attempted to explain everything that existed without the benefit of a concept of God. Uh, it was, uh, in its own way, an intellectually respectable system. And many people who uh, were far from stupid actually believed in, in this ideology and were ready even to sacrifice their lives in the name of the system which this ideology created. After the fall of the Soviet Union, of course, it was impossible to reestablish Marxism-Leninism. But the strange thing is, that after the fall of the Soviet Union and the liberation of the Russian people and the people of the other post-Soviet, uh, the other countries which emerged from the wreckage of the Soviet Union uh, were liberated from ideological control, at least in the case of the Russians, the first thing they began looking for was a new ideology. And this began not just uh, under Putin, it actually began under Yeltsin. Yeltsin, after his uh, re so-called re-election, although we don't know whether he was really re-elected, uh, in 1996, assembled a group of people to seek an ideology for, the, for Russia, a new state ideology. Of course, people came up with various crazy ideas. One person said that the, the, the new ideology should be an ideology of morality whatever that, and no one was not clear what that meant, but a group of people in St. Petersburg decided that they were going to establish this new ideology on the basis of St. Petersburg, and even developed a kind of morality police and a system of informers. So uh, the new uh, ideology of morality, which was supposed to replace Marxism-Leninism, began to look a lot like the communist ideology that it replaced. Uh, it's also true that there were, under Yeltsin, uh, hints that a part of this new ideology, part of this new idea that would replace Marxism-Leninism, uh, would be uh, an attempt to dominate the countries that had once been part of the Soviet Union. Uh, there was no easy way to justify such a thing. But in 1994, the strategic doctrine of the Russian armed forces called for the defense of, of, of Russians living, of ethnic Russians living outside the territory of the so-called Russian Federation. Although I don't think it's, it's, I can't imagine why people call this country Russian Federation 
if, if you cannot elect the regional leaders and they are appointed from Moscow, then some, some, someday people will explain that. But in any case, such a concept was uh, uh, enunciated in the wake, actually, of the destruction of the Russian parliament in 1993. So this idea has been around for a while. In fact, it emerged almost immediately after the fall of the Soviet Union. The Soviet, the, the Russia lost Eastern Europe, it lost the Baltic Republics, but it was seeking a way to justify possibly taking over or controlling those countries that had once been part of the Soviet Union, arguably including the Baltic Republics because the Baltic Republics also had large ethnic Russian populations. In 2000, when Putin became, was inaugurated as president, in his remarks, he made two interesting comments. He said, first of all, that in Russia, all decisions, the, the, the responsibility for all decisions will always be with the head of state, with the person who's in charge of the country. This was a hint, and it, it was played out later, that Putin fully intended to impose a personal dictatorship. But he also made another statement. He said that he would consider one of his responsibilities to be the defense of Russians inside Russia and outside its borders. Well, of course, the last person who really insisted on defending uh, uh, members of a, of a nationality who were citizens of another country was Hitler in his, in his so-called defense of the Sudeten Germans. And we know how that ended. As the situation in Russia became, on the one hand, more corrupt, and, on the, and at the same time, uh, uh, the, Russian, the Russian government uh, had increased flexibility because of the increase in prosperity due, to the, due in part to the rise in raw materials prices, these ideas became, uh, more, it be, became more frequently expressed. The idea that Russia, Russia had the, the situation of the Russians in the, in, the, in the Baltic republics began to be mentioned more and more frequently in international forums. Uh, the, uh, in 2007, when the Estonians attempted to, to remove uh, a Russian war memorial statue in the center of Tallinn and move it to a, a military cemetery, there were riots in Tallinn that, and a cyber attack on Estonia that were inspired by, by, uh, by Russia. But uh, now, as the situation has become more threatening for Russia, and the need to uh, embark on foreign aggression in order to, to, to justify the regime inside the country has become more acute, this ideology of a Russian world, of, of an obligation to, to uh, defend uh, ethnic Russians and Russian speakers and Russian passport holders, wherever those people manage to be. I mean, it's interesting because I'm also a Russian speaker and the Russian government has done nothing to defend me. But, the, but, the, but it, it only underscores the, the, the artificiality of this claim to be the defender of Russians. And unlike, it, is, it, it has been defended with the help of various philosophical and historical arguments. We can go into those later. Some of them are related to the ideas of Eurasianism, which appeared in the 1920s after the Russian Revolution and have had a kind of underground insistence in Russia ever since. But the important part here is not that. I think the important part is that if Marxism was an ideology which, once it was adopted, led almost automatically to the takeover of a country, by a small group of people who nonetheless ruled within the framework of that ideology. What we have in the way of, your, of the, it, it, when we talk of, speak of the Russian idea, 
is a purely artificial construct which is being used by a small group of people who already control the resources and politics of the country in order to justify their rule. And it's being applied in every situation in which, as a propaganda reinforcement for those foreign policy steps that they consider to be necessary to preserve their rule. I mean, we've seen the history of the, of the post-Soviet period. And what, one of the tendencies that we've noticed and that we cannot deny is that when the regime feels threatened, it starts a war. The first war was the war in Chechnya in 1994, the end of 1994, at a time when Yeltsin was seriously concerned about his political situation. And his advisors told him that he needed a short, victorious war, which ended up as being as, about as short and victorious as the Russo-Japanese War in, the 19, in, in 1905, which led to the 1905 revolution. Uh, 1999, uh, there was the Second Chechen War, which was necessary in order to follow the apartment bombings uh, in September 99. It was necessary in order to put Putin into power and save the, the Yeltsin entourage. 2008 was the war with Georgia, which was necessary to reinforce the position of Dmitry Medvedev. And now in 2013, the war with uh, or 2014, the war with uh, Ukraine, uh, which, is a, in, which is necessary in order to distract the attention of the Russian people from the real lessons of the anti-criminal revolution that took place in Ukraine, and which could serve as a model for the peaceful removal of the, of the, of the Putin regime. So under these circumstances, uh, when war becomes a necessary part of a country's foreign policy, propaganda inevitably becomes uh, a necessary accompaniment. And having developed this idea that Russia is on the one hand a special civilization, a unique civilization, that it, that it, it, it actually defends a higher form of morality than the morality of the West, uh, and that Russia has a duty to defend Russian-speaking people. All that's really necessary uh, uh, is to make sure, on the one hand, that those people who are exposed to that idea are treated to unending, relentless, and mindless propaganda, and that no one who has an attempt, who has the sophistication to actually explain what this, uh, these ideas mean and their implications ever has the opportunity to address the Russian public. And that, by and large, is what's happening. Uh, the, it is true that Russian propaganda, Russian so-called soft power, is also directed uh, at the outside world. One of the principal instruments, as we know, is the Russian television station, Russian Today. It has some success. The greatest success of Russian Propaganda, however, in the outside world is not convincing anyone because there's nothing to convince. It's simply too ridiculous. But rather to create the impression that the Russians are sincere in what they're saying rather than purely manipulative. Inside the, the country, the, the goal is really the complete zombification of the population. And uh, for the moment, that has been proceeding successfully. So I think that the the the, the necessary response, the necessary response is uh, to try to show the real roots of this propaganda, to show that it has been from the beginning a device of manipulation, and also to make clear that uh, uh, values uh, are uh, universal values that apply to everyone. And uh, the source of values is, uh, is certainly not the interests of a given country, and, and even less the interests of a given regime. So uh, on that note, I will, I, will, uh, I, I will close and pass on to uh, Andre, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, but we can return to this later. Thank you. Thank you, David. Actually, uh, I heard in Ukraine a couple of months ago, 
uh, I'm watching Russia TV and afraid to uh, I went to Kishetsk and now I'm afraid to watch Russia TV. Uh, so, but uh, the rush for soft power actually is not just a propaganda, it's not just a meme. Uh, and even more, it's not just a concept of Ruski uh, Mir and even there is a religion and so on, so on. Uh, we, uh, we're well known is the Russia's compatriot protection policy, so called compatriot protection policy. And I remember uh, Mr. Surkov's very famous article, Sovereign Democracy, uh, it was published in 2007. But I think my question is usually uh, countries uh, try to use some power to avoid the war, to avoid the conflict. Uh, we are witnessing that Russia tried to use uh, soft power and that this propaganda to prepare conflict. We had such in Georgia. We are witnessing the same situation in the Ukraine. So, what are the main goals of implementation of such conflict? Maybe the quasi countries around the Russia and uh, make a, uh, managing conflict or what is it? Um, all right, fourth point, we should come back to that. All right, uh, first of all, thank you very much, Yuri, uh, for inviting us here and for having this uh, discussion. I think it's very timely, interesting, and useful, certainly for the Georgian audience as well as for a Russian audience and for audience of all those countries uh, for whom uh, this concept of Ruskimia would be not only an abstract concept, but a very real one. So that is why I'm going to talk a little bit about these uh, two Oskimir's uh, concepts, imaginative and the real one. But just before, uh, just trying to answer this uh, the general question about the soft power, I think soft power is not necessarily designed to, uh, to avoid the war. Uh, soft power as well as hard power <coughs> is designed to win. Uh, not necessarily a situation could use war, both hard war or soft war, or hybrid war or some kind of non conventional war, doesn't matter. But the power is being designed, constructed, built, sustained, expanded to win, to some kind of to overwhelm, to produce um, uh, some kind of pressure on the other side. So that is why when we're dealing uh, with power, we got this how it is called soft or very soft or white and puffy. It's still power, so that is why we should be very careful uh, with the power and with the, the, kind of the direction uh, how this power is being used. Um, so, uh, and, uh, in this regard, we also can look into this element of soft power because it's a pretty wide range of instruments that can be used and that are being used uh, in front of our eyes. One of these interesting concepts, one among many others, we, at least we will mention them, like the Eurasian Union, or some kind of, uh, or the KB, or some other organization, so on, just, uh, or just you mentioned this, you know, the uh, sort of shivers uh, uh, of different kinds of different it shows that uh, people are smart and creative and they're kind of pretty busy uh, working on different concepts. And now, since this concept of Roskimir became uh, rather popular this year, we need to look into the roots of this particular concept. And there, uh, these, uh, the deepest roots of this concept of Roskimir, at least as I was able to uh, uh, kind of, uh, find out, was 1674, once again, it is uh, not Mr. Putin in power, not even Mr. Yeltsin in power, maybe it was even before Russian Empire has been officially announced by Peter the Great in 1721. It is 1674. And it's interesting to mention here that this concept has not been developed in Moscow. That's very interesting. The concept, the first uh, version of this concept has appeared in Kiev in Kiev Pichotsky Abbey, and it is written by a uh, number of monks, monks in this Abbey. Uh, we don't still don't know the names of those people, but the general consensus among historians that the main author, at least, at least one of the main authors, all of these things, and kind of the cover, 
of this group was the um, so the boss of the FB, uh, the Diamond Key, which shows the Q, uh, which was KP. I would remind you that those who, who studied them in school were probably forgotten already by that time, that it was 20 years after Kiev has been taken by Russian troops in the Russian Polish War after the Bogdan Kmininsky uprising and after the some kind of the so-called union or agreement between uh, then uh, Ukraine and the Bogdan Kmininsky with Moscow. So at that time uh, the some kind of Russo field uh, mood in Ukraine was pretty strong because it was not so much Russo field or Moscow, but it was a kind of more uh, Eastern Orthodox field because at that time Ukrainians uh, felt very strong oppression from uh, 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 Catholic Poland. So that is why uh, the ministry was certainly not national nor ethnic. Uh, that time was main issue was religious. Religi religious and that is why they tried to defend themselves from uh, confession uh, pressure and uh, persecutions. And that is why there was a genuine some kind of movement towards Moscow because Moscow was considered to be one of the defenders of orthodoxy. And this group of people, because Moscow was that time not very educated and not very well developed in terms of creating different interest concepts, unlike Ukraine. And unlike Kyiv, there was very many uh, very educated people, very some kind of advanced, uh, exposed to Western ideas, exposed to Byzantine ideas and so on. They had developed, this group of people had developed a concept of a union of the kind of, of the United Nation, which would uh, some kind of would put together some kind of embrace two branches of one nation. All the nations were called Russian, and it would consist of three branches. Some were great Russians, very kind of uh, little Russians, uh, Malarosi, uh, Ukrainians, and white Russians, developed. So the first time that concept has been developed over there, and it has uh, been reflected uh, very soon in the title of the Russian Tsar or Russian Emperor, that would be Samadjan, Samadjan, Velikanuski, Malaruski, Velikanuski, Samadjan, Rasi Veliki, Malai Dil. It's just kind of the title. So that is why this concept that has pretty artificial concept that has developed that has been developed by this group of very particular people has been picked up by Moscow uh, authorities and has been translated <coughs> into the most important element of soft power, the title, the title of the emperor. Because it has been repeated regularly each time when the name of Tsar or name of emperor has been pronounced. In every some kind of church, in every place that is, you know, the title of the Tsar or Emperor has been pronounced, that was repeated that it's you know, the same, uh, they hold all those territories and it's considered to be one nation with a little branch, it's not so important. This, uh, and this book, uh, probably I did not mention the name of the book, the book was Synopsis. And this is a, some kind of the most uh, often printed book in, since 1674 for the next almost two centuries. It's the most popular history uh, textbook in uh, Moscow and after that in the Russian Empire until it has been replaced with modern books only in this kind of second part of the 19th century. It's been repeated many, many times. So, and it was, uh, even it has not been uh, published anymore, it has put a uh, ground for all works uh, in history that have been written by Karantin, by Salovyov, by uh, all other great Russian historians, but it was considered it as given that there is one nation, it's like the possibility kind of ethnically the same uh, <coughs> nation. I was going to fast forward to the kind of, uh, to the uh, uh, to the 21st century, just because it's not so interesting, and actually the concept was largely forgotten. It was already started to be forgotten uh, in the in the time of Russian Empire. Slightly, but well, actually not put so much uh, importance to it. But certainly during the Soviet Union, it was completely forgotten because the concept was different. There was three uh, close, probably, but different nations: Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusians, and there was 
Uh, no communist leader say such a stuff, but okay, it's a one nation. No, no, it was quite, quite different. The revival of this concept has happened in year 2009, I mean, in terms of some kind of official recognition of that. So, I mean, there were some people, as you know, some kind of marginals uh, in Russia as well, many in some other places, that would, would write some kind of strange books or strange papers that nobody put any attention. And by the way, the, uh, the, uh, the Chechen wars and the Russian Georgian war, all of them have happened before these concepts have taken, have been picked up by Putin. So that is why before year 2009, even during year 2008, there was no mentioning of this concept of the Russian uh, so There was talk about the so-called genocide of positions or some kind of defense of uh, Russian peacekeepers, but nobody, nobody has mentioned the Muslim at that time. So, why, what happened in year 2009? In year 2009, there was a revery uh, in Donskoye Cemetery of the remnants of uh, General Anton Dimikin and the philosopher of Ivan Ilyin. And during this ceremony, uh, Mr. Putin visited uh, Donskoye Cemetery and I talked to the uh, priest of the cemetery and according to his uh, conversation later, he said that Mr. Putin spent with me almost one hour talking about the contribution of Mr. Dinikin and Mr. Yin, uh, some kind of indigenous Russian history and so on. And especially he praised both of them, as we all remember, neither Dinikin nor Yin, uh, never been praised in the Soviet Union because they were considered to be belonging to the white army to the enemy and so on. But Mr. Putin praised both of them and mostly praised uh, both of them for uh, keeping this concept of Ruskinir. And it is true, if you, look, uh, if you read memoirs of Anton Dinikin or in the papers of the Anton that they were both very strong proponents of Ruskinir concept, which means denial of existence of independent Ukrainian and Belarusian nations. And if you remember the slogan under which uh, many white armies fought during the Civil War uh, on the territory of the Russian Empire, the slogan was for uh, for Russia is uh, united and undivided. And in the sense of, uh, in the kind of the view of those people, it means there was no right not only for uh, some other uh, national uh, states or other class, but definitely there was no right, neither for Ukraine or for Belarusia, to have even so-called quasi-Soviet states. So they did consider Russia as some kind of unifying all these, uh, all these, uh, all this part as one unity. So that is I'm okay. It could in year 2009 was considered not uh, maybe very seriously, but uh, some kind of the private uh, remarks that uh, Putin made in conversation with some priest, it is too far from uh, any official policy. Time for official policy came on July 27th, year 2013, again to Kiev, to the place from which this concept started its uh, some kind of life. During the 1025th anniversary, of the baptism of Kiev and Rus. Mr. Putin came to Kiev and made a speech to the big gathering of uh, different people of, uh, uh, kind of from official though, from civil society and from clergy. And he proclaimed, and this is the first time, officially proclaimed that there is no such nations like Ukrainians, like the Russians, in we one we all one nation. Russians, Ukrainians, the Russians. We came from one, some kind of root, from some kind of Kievsky Kupere. So that is why, so we just, we should be essentially under the same state, cover, state, rule, state structure. So he also mentioned some other thing that was very clear and explicit uh, statement of his new and very serious ideological position. Because two days later, Mr. Nishinka, chief sanitary doctor of Russia, started the sanitary offensive against Ukraine.
the statement that uh, Putin made on uh, July 27th happened to be, as we now look okay, from a historical point of view, official announcement of the war for the Muslims. And that war has different elements of that. Certainly the element of hybrid war and the element of the real war, conventional war. But the official announcement of the beginning of this war was, again, July 27th, uh, year 2013, uh, <coughs> during the 1,000th anniversary of baptism of Ivan. So that is what your early comment about the kind of soft power, particular concept it being used for launching war is very relevant because it's exactly what happened. happened. So official announcement of this concept was the beginning of the first Russian-Ukrainian war, but it was, as the concept has said, it's not only against Ukrainians, against Belarusians as well, because the concept denies the, uh, the rightful existence for these nations and for these states. And as we know, uh, they just this right uh, uh, for existing has been denied also in the case of Kazakhstan mm -hmm. in the recent remarks in August. Uh, mm -hmm. So they probably Kazakhstan, this whole Kazakhstan uh, could hardly could be qualified for the part of Muslimia, it's the whole Kazakhstan. But at least part of Kazakhstan that uh, in use of uh, Kremlin uh, might. So but this is a concept, this is ideological concept. Now we're coming to the real core. As a result of the war, <coughs> and hybrid war, the real war uh, against Ukraine, as a result of the occupation and annexation of Crimea, and as a result of the uh, of battles in eastern Ukraine, uh, as has, that has been portrayed by Putin and by all these uh, criminal propaganda people, that was a war uh, which kind of ethnic Russians against ethnic Ukrainians because ethnic Ukrainians. Although some became junta, fascist, Nazis, banderas, all the you know all this stuff. So that is why it was a kind of the the trick and the ethnic war, the ethnic war of Russians or some Russian-speaking people against those of who oppress them. Okay, uh, but it is also important to look into the real sense of sociology of those who fighting there. Even before the war, in April, uh, Ukrainians performed the probably the most detailed sociological study of those eight, uh, eight oblasts of Ukraine that had been called uh, by Mr. Putin Navarrosia. And they studied very carefully the attitudes of population of this, all of them are much more some kind of crucified, more ethnic Russians, more Russian-speaking people than in the Western and Central uh, Ukraine. Nevertheless, they studied what did they public attitude towards independence from Ukraine, towards joining Russia, towards greet Russian troops if they would come to, uh, to those areas. Uh, their readiness to join Russian troops uh, to, to, uh, to try to join the ranks of those who are fighting against the Ukrainian government and so on. Just a number of very detailed questions concerning you know, the, really the, uh, the basis for this ethnic resentment, or some kind of language resentment, uh, towards Ukraine. And they found <coughs> that in most of this, uh, not talking about Central and uh, Western Ukraine, but in most of these eight oblasts, support for this kind of irredentism towards Russia, or irredentism from Ukraine or joining Russia, was at level 8 to 12 percent. So absolute majority of these uh, oblasts of these regions, even they, many of them, uh, either ethnic Russians or Russian speaking, were in April 2014 for Ukraine, not for joining Russia, not for the Russia. So slightly higher levels were of this well, pro-Russian mood in Odessa and Kharkiv. It was 18 percent, and the highest. Uh, among uh, uh, all these oblasts were Donetsk and Luhansk. In each of those uh, regions, the support for this pro-Russian uh, sentiment was at level 30%. <coughs> which means that about 70% of population were pro-Ukrainians. Even they do, did speak and do speak Russian in their kind of, uh, everyday life. Even many of them ethnic Russians and even many of them do not speak Ukrainian in everyday life. 
But this kind of political attitude was very clear for Ukraine. So that is why this, uh, the basis was uh, for this kind of Russian uh, Ukrainian war, ethnic war, was pretty low actually, there was no basis. But after that was the war, and now we have eight months of fighting, and we have uh, huge evidence, just those people who are fighting on, let's say, volunteer battalions uh, on the Ukrainian side, most of them are ethnic Russians and Russian-speaking Ukrainians. There are some uh, Ukrainian-speaking Ukrainians, but they are a minority in those, uh, in those battalions. If you listen to the kind of language of conversation in, on both sides, it's Russian. If you listen to the kind of to swearing, it's the Russian. Everything is Russian. So if you look into what actually the whether some kind of issues of ethnicity or language is important in this battle, that would be enough. It is a kind of in 20 days, it is positioning one of the most important issues. So those issues of ethnicity or language do not exist in reality. Something else exists. What exactly? Once again, if you look what kind of slogans or the goals of those people fighting on the so-called Italian People's Republic or Lugansk, uh, People's Republic is very clear. It's kind of restoration of the Soviet Union. So kind of, it's kind of many communist slogans. It's a kind of nationalization of uh, productive assets, the kind of the equal distribution, and so on. This is not Russian slogans. It is not a Russian program. It is Soviet program. But the way how it is presented, it's not even the Soviet. Uh, I would use the word, but it's probably not the very academic one, but probably rather correct. It is South Poe. <laughs> so I understand that the kind of it's a little bit vulgar, it's a bit language, but uh, those of us, many of us who live through the Soviet Union, we do get very clear difference between the Soviet life and South Poe life. So that is why what we see in Eastern Donbass, it's not that it's not the Soviet life, it's not the Soviet life, it's South Poe life. And some slogans. And um, when we see really what's kind of what kind of the differences between those people, both you actually some Ukrainians are actually fighting on this side as well, ethnic Ukrainians. So that is why if we have a war there, but it's not Russian-Ukrainian war, it is Savkova Rasiska Vaina or Sarkova Ukraine like that. I apologize again for using not so wonderful words, but just to, to sort of reflect the essence of the conflict. So that is why this conflict between mentalities, mentalities modernized and not modernized. And when we look around, we will find several pockets of a very similar mentality. One of the most visible is Transnistria, where some kind of this and kind of the uh, uh, all their life has been restored or preserved to be not correctly. There are some elements of this in South Ossetia, Ossetia or Wallace, some, some elements in Abkhazia, and some elements actually exist uh, if you visit in northeastern Estonia, near Narva, and eastern Latvia in Malgaria. Maybe some other places as well, just we need to look around. So that is why what's interesting result appeared in this fight, in this war for Ruski Mir, it happened to be the fighting not for Ruski Mir, but for Sovietski or post Sovietski or Savkovi Mir. So that is why some kind of the idea of imaginary wars was one, but the real world was a different one. And, and that is why some kind of the, uh, what we're dealing with, it, there was an attempt to restore, to sustain, and to spread during the Russian Georgian War, during the conflict in Moldova, during the Russian Ukraine War, to create and sustain South Bolivia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. A very detailed and interesting. Uh, we were introduction. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, 
Uh, currently, uh, four years ago, since uh, our famous uh, uh, Dmitry Trenin, head of the Moscow Economic Center, published his uh, article uh, uh, when he mentioned that it's right time to change Russia policy to, toward Georgia and switch soft power concept. Uh, actually, it was the first time when regarding the uh, Georgia, uh, there was like the first sign that it could be used something else, uh, like for instance, uh, gas power or energy power or military power. Uh, and if we look into the documents um, adopted by the Russian officials about uh, the program, how to work with the compatriots abroad, yeah, uh, they pay a lot of attention uh, how to uh, how to develop this concept on the Georgian territory. So, how do you think? Uh, are they successful? Uh, have they here real some supporters or? Uh, can we expect such focus into the future? Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, for this panel. Uh, it's really noteworthy that we speaking about the Russian salt power in the playground of Russian salt power in Tbilisi, and uh, also in the time when Russian salt power actually had the highest uh, identity status, I would say, in Ukraine and generally for Soviet uh, space. Uh, before uh, to uh, speak about the uh, Georgian case, I would like to take um, my 10 cents about the definition of soft power. Uh, it was already mentioned about the uh, definition which was provided by Joseph Nye, but he also um, he has a, his, um, different, uh, a different understanding of soft power, uh, which is little bit different than Russian political class understanding. At least according to Joseph Nye, he said that um, you know, in, order, uh, in order to have a successful uh, policy and use soft power, you need um, attraction, you have to have attraction. And an end result of this also should be that, um, uh, that both sides, it should be, uh, both sides should be minus. So it should be mutually, um, uh, say, uh, profitable for both sides. Unfortunately, the Russian political class uh, didn't understand that. The Russian, uh, Russian understanding of soft power is a little bit different than the real one uh, in, in the Western sense. So um, having said that, um, I actually have to admit that I wrote 2000, uh, 2009 a uh, small memo um, can, can uh, Russia win uh, ideological battle in Georgia. Actually, I wrote it uh, and I presented it in DC. So that time, uh, when I read it, actually yesterday, I just uh, uh, read it again, and I uh, thought that I think I was too much optimistic. Because that time, I wrote this actually after the Russian-Georgia war, so we were still under the emotions. Um, so I thought that, and I was really, really, really rigid, that I thought that you know, Russia doesn't really have uh, um, any chance to win ideological battle or use a soft power to change the Georgia's foreign um, security uh, policy. Uh, but um, after looking to this case again, I'm not exactly so sure. Uh, and we can say that Russia has a success, some success in uh, using soft power in Georgia, and uh, I have some failures uh, as well. Uh, so, um, if you look um, uh, to the Georgian Russian history, I think um, we know that it was always problematic and we had what I call uh, poisonous relations uh, starting from 1991. And there was a stereotype from both sides, uh, you know, Georgia was considering uh, Russia as a supporter uh, of the um, uh, separatist movement in Georgia. And when uh, Russia was, uh, uh, Russia uh, see Georgia, as a kind of uh, um, kind of like um, uh, not really reliable partner, uh, and uh, this misunderstanding uh, started from 90s and the old thing changed, and didn't change. Uh, but um, now, basically, as you most of you remember, uh, Russia didn't have time to think about Georgia, you know, foreign policy on Georgia until uh, Putin came in. Uh, before that, uh, there was some kind of archaic policy toward Georgia. Uh, but when Putin came in, and especially um, uh, you know, the, after the Cold Revolution, that was a sign for Russian political class that they need to do something. Because what they understand is, 
they're losing actually post-Soviet space, especially countries like Georgia and Moldova. So um, that time, then they understand that they need to um, uh, uh, adopt some kind of new policy and to use so-called Russian soft power. And uh, in that sense, um, they started uh, to use uh, this concept. But unfortunately, uh, for most post-Soviet uh, countries, they were, uh, they were um, actually uh, using that as a propaganda, not as a really soft power tool. And if, if we see that um, results, especially um, related, uh, if we analyze the situation in the Georgia's occupied territories, that's, uh, the, uh, and uh, Russia was using its soft power almost like the last 20 years, and it started actually uh, when they delivered uh, Russian passports to these uh, breakaway uh, regions. And that time, Georgian um, government and Georgian political class, even though uh, you know, they protested, uh, they thought that um, you know, it would not be so important. But as you see from today's um, uh, situation, I, I think that was the really start of the problem. Um, and uh, but I think that uh, uh, if we speak about the, uh, you know, how Russia is using soft power uh, in case of Georgia, the milestone is um, uh, the, uh, after the Russian-Georgia war. As you know, after the Russian-Georgia war, actually, uh, Russia managed to eliminate the Georgian population. So there was no sympathy towards Russia, and it is still so. Um, uh, maybe there's some changes, and I will talk about this a little bit later. So uh, at, at some point, the Kremlin, um, you know, the, um, uh, the Kremlin understand that they need to change something in Georgia because they already use actual hard power. So they need to somehow change it the image of Russia. And uh, uh, unfortunately for Russian uh, policymakers, they also spoiled Russian image not only Georgia but in uh, other post-Soviet countries. Basically, uh, there's a four, um, I would say, items which they can, um, you know, offer uh, Georgia and the use of soft power. One of the uh, one of the, uh, this uh, first uh, item is the uh, huge market. Uh, as you know, that Russia is a big country and uh, uh, one of the biggest in former Soviet Union. It still um, enjoys, um, you know, some influence and especially economic influence over the neighbors. And uh, even though Georgia managed recently uh, this, uh, the, the former administration to lessen its economic ties, especially after the war and before the war, and we know all the history about the embargo and all this kind of thing, that thing which I don't want to repeat, uh, you know, the, this uh, market is still lucrative for post Soviet countries, including Georgia. And uh, unfortunately, what we see right now uh, with Georgia and Russian uh, relations is that. After the so-called normalization policy, which new government actually initiated, uh, normally, uh, I mean, nobody should be against it. And uh, you know, uh, Russia is our neighbor, and we understand that uh, we cannot change neighbors, so we cannot change geography. But uh, if you follow the trends in Georgian and Russian uh, relations, especially with trade, uh, after the change of government, uh, before the change of government, uh, Russia was uh, not even among the ten, uh, you know, uh, trading partners in, in Georgia. Recently, if you see this uh, uh, trend, Russia became number four, actually, the uh, trading partner. So, uh, that, uh, uh, I mean, normally, if there was a normal relations between two countries, it should not be a big problem. But we see that there, there's a still, we don't have diplomatic relations, uh, the still relations is very tense. So, uh, under this condition, uh, there's uh, some threat that uh, Russia may use uh, this as a tool. And we know that they already did it in Moldova, and, Moldova was, um, I mean, they had uh, imposed embargo second time to Moldova, so I think there is some threat uh, um, in this respect to Georgia as well. And also, uh, another uh, uh, tool which they use in Georgia, this is a religion. And uh, if, you, if you follow the, especially the uh, religious link between Russia and Georgia, they are quite active. Even after the uh, Russian-Georgia war, actually, uh, after the weeks, uh, Georgian patriarch and Russian patriarch, they managed actually to uh, to somehow calm down uh, and uh, to, uh, um, I would say, uh, they managed uh, to um, have a good relations. And as a result, we see that um, uh, both of the um, patriarch, they used uh, their influence in their um, countries. And interestingly, what happened that, um, you know, unlike the uh, state of Russia, which recognized South Ossetia and Adria as independent nations, Russian Orthodox Church didn't uh, pursue the same policy.
So, and uh, of course we understand this, is, this was not because, you know, they, they have a special sympathy toward Georgia or something, because there was another reason. One of the reasons was that uh, they don't want to have a revenge from Georgian uh, Orthodox Church uh, in regards to Ukraine, and uh, so some other uh, issues as well. Uh, so, uh, and if we see even today, uh, there is a uh, quite um, close links between these uh, two Orthodox churches. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, Georgian Orthodox Church enjoys quite um, good reputation among the Georgian public. It's uh, uh, Georgian Patriarch has more than 91, um, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, per percent uh, uh, of the support from the population. So I think uh, the Russians, they understand it. And um, if you read uh, uh, several articles written by Georgian, uh, by Russian experts, uh, they try to somehow uh, misuse this um, against uh, Georgia. And another um, element which Russia tries to exploit in Georgia, this is a cultural and historical uh, memory. And if you see that uh, every, uh, uh, every uh, 9th of May, Russian president, uh, whoever it is, uh, Putin or Medvedev, they always um, uh, send a special address to Georgian people and Georgian nation, even though uh, they may uh, not have a um, uh, diplomatic relation with Georgia. So they somehow try to influence, especially the, uh, the people, elderly people, because uh, they are not so successful with the younger generation. Uh, uh, I mean, we can talk about this, a uh, uh, lot about this issue, but uh, I just want to uh, speak uh, uh, about the results of the Russian foreign policy uh, at this uh, at this moment. That um, what we can see um, uh, and what the Russian was trying to do is um, they uh, after the Russian Georgia war they try they understand that they cannot really change the Georgia's foreign policy and there is some kind of consensus public consensus in Georgia. But what they try they try to infiltrate Georgian political uh, politics. Uh, especially they realized that after the conflict they lost the influence on Georgian politics. So uh, they're trying to gain some influence uh, in this and they try to somehow support the um, uh, pro-Russian uh, groups to, um, to make them uh, more visible. And we can see it and that we have a lot of uh, groups like this, Eurasian Choice and some other groups which, are, uh, which became actually very active lately and uh, they, uh, they actually proposing um, Ideas that Georgia should become member of the Russian Union, all this uh, which uh, we all know, and uh, um, also uh, another thing is they also try to um, uh, influence the public opinion. And we had several uh, unsuccessful results. And uh, recently, uh, most of you probably remember that there was an attempt to um, uh, to establish here the uh, Russian radio station in Sputnik, which was unsuccessful. Uh, but at least this. Um, uh, uh, this is uh, interesting that at least uh, we can see that R Russia is still trying to influence Georgian public opinion. And one of the results, uh, one, uh, one of the aim of this um, uh, policy is not to directly change uh, Georgian foreign policy per se, but maybe to support Russian neutral forces to come to the power. And then maybe after this to change the, uh, if they can manage. Uh, Georgia's um, uh, foreign policy orientation, which they consider part of the sort of uh, uh, Russian world. Uh, so, and um, you can see that a lot of articles written about Georgian history and all this uh, kind of stuff. And interestingly, uh, recently they also started um, to uh, try to win um, hearts and minds of Georgians, especially they started to establish so-called platforms when they bringing the journalists from Moscow and, uh, you know, they're making trainings here for Georgian journalists. Mm -hmm. To say frankly, I don't understand what kind of training they can offer when uh, Russia, as we know, doesn't have so much attraction for Georgia. It's not a, uh, you know, like consolidated democracy. It cannot really offer anything to Georgia, which is actually, uh, as you know, already signed association agreement with the European Union. So in that sense, there's uh, not really much which uh, present Russia can offer uh, to Georgia. But they're still uh, trying to uh, influence. And most uh, painful uh, for um, Russian uh, experts who are really close to the uh, uh, family uh, is not uh, that they're losing Georgia as a country, but um, especially uh, when I'm speaking with them personally sometimes, um, they, they feel very painfully when they hear the um, stories from Georgia that most of the young people, they don't speak Russian language here. 
Uh, so for them it's um, really painful because they understand that uh, there are some limits of the Russian soft power in, uh, in, in Georgia. So, but at the same time, I cannot really ignore that, um, especially if you see, if you go to the uh, Tbilisi, you can see that still a lot of people, they actually watching Russian movies. Um, you, you can, uh, even when you go to the restaurant, you can uh, hear, especially after the change of government, and even before that, that, uh, that was not, maybe not so common, but at least there were some cases. So uh, in that sense, and there's also some kind, some part of the society which has, uh, especially elderly generation, which has some kind of nostalgia to the Soviet uh, past. It's, it doesn't really mean exactly the Soviet past it's, uh, as such. Sometimes it's um, their personal, um, I, I would say, like uh, personal memories about when they were young, and uh, so we we still have this um, this part of the population. I think there's a lot of things which, uh, uh, where we can uh, speak about these uh, topics, but probably I'll stop here and uh, um, probably much better if we will uh, continue with the question. Thank you, Colonel for a very interesting presentation. Uh, so, I'm sure that our audience has lots of questions, so now I open the floor. Uh, I will take uh, uh, five question and uh, you can to to our speaker to answer and later I can take more and more. So please. Thank you. Um, well, I would like to thank you for the panel very much for a very interesting uh, discussion. Um, my name is Robert Siami, University of Cambridge. And uh, I wanted to ask Corneli about uh, specific NGOs that you are aware of that are funded by the Russian government. Because this is, of course, very much soft power. And, uh, is the second point, is there also something like what just had in Germany a few like two weeks ago, uh, where members of the establishment actually are uh, singing the Russian song, and maybe heard this appeal or something, by and others, uh, which is obviously coming from some quarters in the German establishment uh, funded by the Russians. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Henry, sir, uh, do we have... Uh, I'm moderator. No, uh, <laughs> sorry, do, do we have uh, uh, moving towards the, to establish a new alliance, uh, defend, uh, alliance of defending countries between Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova and use uh, our soft power against uh, to prevent the hard aggression uh, from Russia? Thank you. So the question goes to to all speakers. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. I'm George Zadeshvili, University of Georgia. Uh, my question goes to all three panelists. Uh, if I may, just two questions that they will be short, I promise. Uh, the first one, mm, is the current economic crisis, deepening economic crisis in Russia, will make the country lose the luster and diminish its uh, potential soft power? And second, I believe generally that uh, relations and uh, Russia's soft power depends not only on Russia, but on the image of the West. The image of the West, so it's, I wouldn't say it's shaky, but it's, like, it's not like constantly, it's not as adorable as it was for 15, 20 years ago. There's like certain crisis, and one of the reasons is that people believe that the West doesn't help Georgia and Ukraine as it should do. So there was a slump in the uh, support for NATO European Union after 2008 war. Uh, currently, many Georgians don't regard actually the West is not supporting Ukraine as it should do. So, do you think that um, so uh, the part of the world is on the Western ground as well? Thank you. Thank you. Any one more? Thank you for your speech. I'd like to ask you about uh, soft power in uh, North Caucasus. All the time we are talking about Belarus, Ukraine, and Russian population, and uh, ethnic Russians, a broader Russia. What about in North Caucasus? There are a lot of uh, ethnic Russians. And what, a couple of days ago, it happened in Grozno, terrorist attacks. And some ISIS, uh, in ISIS, uh, dozens of warriors are from North Caucasus, and they maybe support some kind of attacks or operations in North, North Caucasus. Okay. okay, thanks. So, uh, we have. Four questions to all speakers and one question to the government. Thank you for questions. I will uh, start to address from the first question um, about the NGOs. And I actually mentioned um, uh, one NGO, there's an uh, uh, NGO called Urosian uh, Choice, which is a coalition of NGOs. 
Um, we don't have actually, uh, nobody, at least uh, as I know, nobody really did the research if they really uh, getting the funding. At least they uh, deny it with directly. But, um, uh, I mean, uh, they, they, are quite, uh, uh, they are quite well connected with Russian circles, close to family, so, and uh, they, um, they are quite active, uh, especially recently in, in Georgia. Uh, so there may be some other uh, NGOs who are not really pro-Russian, at least uh, they are not so visible, but there are some other NGOs who actually uh, operate in the same manner. Uh, and also regarding uh, the second part of the question, uh, especially the uh, Russian uh, soft power uh, is very active, uh, actively using, and uh, Russian propaganda using this organization against the association agreement of, uh, of Georgia with the European Union, in the same way uh, they use it in, in, in Ukraine and in Moldova. They portray the European Union as a uh, kind of uh, like uh, post-moral uh, power uh, which doesn't really um, uh, brings anything good for uh, Georgia and some other things. So if you see the latest, latest activity of this organization, they are really active uh, in, uh, in uh, doing the, such activities. Uh, and uh, regarding the, there was a question, how do we use the soft power actually? Uh, there was some time, especially uh, with the um, previous administration, when Georgia was trying, at least attempted, to use its soft power towards North Caucasus. And uh, I cannot really claim that it was uh, all the time successful, but at least there was some attempts, and uh, we, um, the former government, initiated uh, the uh, Russian uh, program. It was called. It was the, uh, the program of this. Uh, uh, yeah, it was called PIC, and it was, uh, as I know, it was quite successful. At least some people in the North, uh, Northern Caucasus uh, was watching it, and at least it, it was a chance theoretically to get some kind of non kremlin uh, narrative um, uh, for this republic. But as you know, after the change of uh, government and under this uh, slogan of normalization, the funding for this uh, television was suspended. Uh, so we don't, uh, as, I, as far as I know, we don't have any uh, policy on how to, uh, how Georgia can actually use the soft power uh, and to say frankly that's not, not really my Georgia can really do against Russia uh, in using soft power. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. I, I will respond to the two questions about uh, the, the, the status of the West uh, and its failure to defend Ukraine and Georgia and the economic sanctions <laughs> and their effect on the on Russia's ability to project itself as the bearer of a new idea or of a convincing idea. Uh, I think that the notion that uh, Russia is uh, a civilization, a separate civilization, that it has something that to teach the West that in fact it's an example to the West and, it, and has held on to values uh, which are uh, fundamental, which the West has, has not respected, is uh, undermined ex extremely well by the economic situation. Not just the fact that Russia is now encountering real economic difficulties. Uh, it's possible even for a poor country to, uh, be, uh, to occupy a very high moral position. But what has been demonstrated by the response of the West to uh, the invasion of uh, Ukraine and uh, to other Russian actions is the extent to which Russia is dependent on the West. And a country which is totally dependent on, on, on the West and which can be punished by the West and uh, 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 is, is, is not convincing just on those grounds as a, uh, a source of values for the West. If it were a source of values, then it would have the wherewithal to be economically uh, self-sufficient. Maybe not rich, but at least not to depend on the people whose values are inferior. The second point is about the uh, uh, failure of the West to defend uh, Ukraine and Georgia. And the effect that that has uh, in this part of the world especially, on the reputation of the West. Uh, there are a couple of points that need to be made. Uh, one is that the defense of uh, Ukraine, even though it, uh, it could have been greater, has not been as weak as one might think. 
uh, the sectoral sanctions that have been imposed on, on, on Russia by the United States uh, and the restrictions on some of the wealthiest people in Russia uh, are likely to have a serious effect, maybe not immediately, but in the long term. Most important thing is that they alerted the whole international business community to the reality that Russia is no place in which to invest your money. And Russia needs investment. They've squandered uh, uh, 15 years of, of, of high oil prices. They didn't create any serious infrastructure during that period. And they need investment. Now they're not going to get it. It's not purely a question of the fact that uh, a given person is punished, a given industry is, 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 uh, uh, is, is placed under sanctions. It's the fact that the, 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 the country as a whole, Russia as a whole, has been identified as a place in which you should not invest. And people are not going to invest there as a result until the situation changes. Situation is bad now. It could get worse. And business people are extremely timid when it comes to their money. They don't like to put their money in places where they might have, they might end up losing it. The, 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 what, what we're seeing, it seems to me, with all this uh, attempt, I don't like the words soft power and hard power. Uh, had bad associations for me, but the, <laughs> I, I prefer something like propaganda or manipulation, things like that. But I think that the Russian propaganda and manipulation is, uh, and, and the attempt to create some kind of pseudo idea, idea or ideology with which to justify their aggression is just not going to, uh, uh, is, is too, too transparently an expression of the desire of a small gang to, to maintain power in Russia. Uh, the, the, this is, a, it's like, it's a, I oftentimes think of Russia less, less as, as a country than as a gang with a foreign policy. And it has not, and this gang not only has a foreign policy, it now has its own idea. The idea stems from the desire of the gang to hold on to power in the country. And it's uh, anything that they, can, that they can use in order to justify it, they will use. But in the, in the, in the long run, uh, the realities of life, the realities of politics and economics are gonna make it un, 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 uh, those ideas unconvincing. And, uh, the, the, uh, and I think that we're seeing that right now. <laughs> All right, maybe this is better. Okay, uh, three questions. The first one, uh, the potential of defense alliance between Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. I think at the moment, close to zero. But uh, the very high extent due to the position of authorities in Georgia. So just, uh, they never expressed any interest in such alliance and did nothing, uh, even just in the very, some kind of emotional support of Maidan. Seems to be none of uh, current Georgian uh, representative visited Kiev uh, on a special visit, uh, with the exception of the integration of uh, Mr. Poroshenko. So there's quite difference from the position of the Ukrainian authorities during the uh, Russian-Georgian war. So that's that's a very clear indication of different attitudes. As for the current economic crisis in Russia, um, uh, the general um, uh, description of this crisis is uh, pretty exaggerated from my point of view. Uh, due to also some, uh, strange to put it mildly, uh, steps uh, undertaken by Russian authorities, like the introduction of a uh, ban on uh, input of foodstuff from European Union and other countries. That's by far much more uh, effective uh, destruction of Russian economy than all Western sanctions taken together. Um, and the uh, providing liquidity of 625 billion rubles for this decision is much more devastating for the exchange rate of ruble than all oil uh, prices for, uh, for any time. So that is why the Russian authorities destroying Russian economy is much more effective than the macroeconomics and the uh, some kind of placement sanctions. 
um, nevertheless, so just it depends uh, what will happen after that. If they will continue to do session state, they will destroy anything, including pretty reasonably uh, working economy. But if they would not, I would suggest, I would uh, easily forecast that the uh, Russian manufacturer would pick up how they started to grow due to the much low exchange rate much low uh, nominal exchange rate, real exchange rate, nominal costs, and instead of uh, recession or economic crisis in Russia, uh, everybody, not everybody, many would be surprised to see the Russian economy growing much faster, uh, growing first and second growing much faster than anybody would expect at this moment. Um, image of the West. The problem is not only with the image of the West, but with the real position of the West. So far, the Western countries uh, were unable to find an appropriate response to the aggressive policy of the Putin's regime. Just they could not find the appropriate response. On one hand, they do not want to engage, to be engaged in confrontation uh, with the nuclear power and all to be saying about that. On the other hand, uh, so the uh, way that they have taken um, uh, actually did not stop uh, Putin from making uh, new aggressive uh, steps uh, and to make the situation more even worse. Uh, Mr. Obama became like an abstain over the last several months uh, from this issue, saying nothing and doing even less uh, in the regard to Russia. Um, the only some kind of changing landscape um, appeared with the some kind of the point of uh, understanding for Angela Merkel uh, after six hour long discussion with Mr. Putin in Brisbane that her approach in the previous nine years towards uh, Russia, towards Putin's Russia, was a clear mistake. And for her, it's just kind of a uh, some kind of dramatic recognition of her personal approach uh, was mistaken and it looks like. Uh, after her comments in Brisbane and after that in the Deutsche Bundestag, it's a kind of the uh, rather fast recognition of a new way. But whether she, along with other Western leaders, would find uh, this way is far from clear. And especially, uh, seems to me, when Mrs. Merkel did her own work and some kind of lonesome, painful lessons, Mr. Obama did not. And without Mr. Obama, uh, Western Alliance uh, could do nothing in uh, containing or resisting or finding uh, any reasonable uh, response to this policy. So that is why we might find us in uh, such a limbo for another two years until election of new US president. And these two years uh, might be a very <clears throat> dangerous, uh, not only risky, but really dangerous for all immediate neighbors of very aggressive Putin's Russia. Thank you. And more questions. So uh, my question is uh, about uh, the shapes which you outlined about uh, Belarus and Ukraine within the, this Russian mir. I would like to ask about the same positions of Georgia. What would you say about long-term plans about Georgia? What, what is the place of uh, Georgia in, in this concept, if, if there is so? And uh, to Mr. Colonel Gakachia, please, uh, I would like to ask about uh, uh, which uh, part of uh, soft policy of Russian regime was uh, most successful during Saakashvili's period. After Shevardnadze's regime and this energetic policy, which can be also uh, named as a soft power. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you to the Sassanian European Youth Alumni Association and European Youth Parliament, Georgia. My question, I would like to uh, ask a question to Mr. David. Uh, the thing is that uh, the European Union was mentioned and the role of investor was also mentioned. Um, can you just go briefly and tell uh, us your opinion 
uh, what should the next steps of European Union consist of or uh, uh, toward the countries that have already uh, signed the association agreement? To cut a long story short, uh, how can uh, European Union promote and support uh, security, stability, and at the same time prosperity uh, with the, in the country, in these countries? Yeah. And well, we're talking about the Russian power, not the European power. So yes, please, but yeah. uh, it can be the just key uh, no, yes, actor. <coughs> Tamar Babawadze, uh, International Black Sea University. Uh, my question will be addressed to Mr. Satter and Mr. Ilarionov. Uh, if we can uh, draw a line between uh, Putin's perception of Eurasian Union and Mr. Dugin's perception of Eurasian Union, who is mainstreaming the idea of Eurasianism in, in contemporary Russia, as Vladimir Putin is dreaming to restore Soviet Union while Dugin is about to create something unique in Eurasia. Uh, what do you think? Are they allies for a long-term perspective, or where their partnership can end? Okay, thank you. Andre, please. <coughs> I didn't the response. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, first of all, uh, about this matter of long-term plan uh, concerning Georgia. First of all, the concept of not so much Mir, that is sort of related, but not, not exactly the same, the concept of strategic unity, compatriot that is being engraved in the Russian legislature, is a very special one. So, the law on uh, compatriots on strategic unity stipulates four categories who fall in these uh, compatriots. First, uh, ethnic Russians, uh, regardless of the place of their living, they are considered to be compatriots. Second, uh, those who speak Russian, regardless of their ethnicity, they are considered to be compatriots. So I understand that many people in this room would be considered, according to that law, uh, potential compatriots. And that is why if uh, some of you, uh, one of you, was kind of called for some kind of help, assistance, so the uh, Russian government would be extremely happy, happy to provide such assistance, both in soft power as well as in hard power forms. Um, uh, two other uh, categories. Um, uh, third category, uh, compatriots are those who ever lived in the territory of the Soviet Union, regardless of their ethnicity and their uh, command of the Russian language and their descendants. And the fourth category, those who ever lived on the territory of the Russian Empire, regardless of the ethnicity of the command of the Russian language, and their descendants. So that is why all those four categories are put into the, kind of, uh, the members for this compatriot of a society or world. And um, you know, one article of this law, and the other, in this law, and a special law actually, stipulates very clearly that for defense of the interests of compatriots, Russian troops can be used, regardless of the agreement or disagreement of the authorities of those nations there, where those compatriots believe. So, which is, uh, gives you some kind of a feeling about the uh, potential interests versus Georgia as well as many other countries. Um, uh, I would <coughs> the question that um, probably was directed to David or uh, other colleagues about well, whether the part of the um, Saakash to this government was most successful from my point of view. I'm an economist and just I can talk about economic reforms and so on, but using this opportunity, I would say that the most uh, successful, it seems to me, rather underestimated, at least in the Georgian society, uh, was the policy of Mr. Saakashvili in August year 2008. Uh, because exactly what has been done by Saakashvili personally, by his government and by the Georgian army, prevented Georgia from occupation by Russian forces. It's very clear, because uh, it was not only intention from the very beginning, but it was the order given to the Russian troops, uh, all Russian troops in Ossetia, in Abkhazia, in Armenia, in Dagestan, and in Black Sea Fleet uh, on August 11th, year 2008, 
to take the Lisi, to occupy, occupy the rest of the country, uh, to overthrow the Georgian government, and to do something to Mr. Sekashvili personally, but he has mentioned it already before. So that is why what has been done, both with hard power and with soft power, and with sacrifice of uh, several hundreds of uh, Georgian uh, military, uh, and with the extremely successful uh, soft power propaganda campaign that uh, Mr. Sakashvili personally led towards uh, the West, towards the mass media, has provoked response from the United States and the demonstrated readiness to provide necessary support, including military one, including with US Navy and US Air Force. All these efforts combined actually saved Georgia from the occupation of the rest of the country by the Russian troops. Uh, last question concerning Mr. Dugin and Mr. Putin. Uh, they are not friends. Uh, it looks like they never met personally. Uh, Mr. Putin does not consider Mr. Dugin too highly, which does not meet, mean that he that, uh, cannot use him effectively what he's actually like, uh, likes to do it. And uh, Mr. Dugin also likes to portray himself as a confidant of Mr. Putin, which is certainly far from the truth. Um, uh, Mr. Dugin, he has own some kind of ideological picture that he's trying to spread around. Uh, Mr. Putin's pretty pragmatic, and he's kind of using different concepts very easily. Uh, sometimes Ruski means, sometimes Eurasian Union, sometimes Customs Union, sometimes Odekab, sometimes Confederate, sometimes uh, <coughs> Thomas Soviet Union, it doesn't matter. Because he's a very pragmatic person and he's some kind of uh, very uh, easy using different channels and different concepts to his personal uh, goals. So that's type of relations. And Mr. Dukin claimed actually that he's a big friend of Mr. Jesinski <laughs> to go there and get a brother in arms in the geopolitics and actually even spreading the his photo picture uh, to get a sense of case. So this is not Western geopolitician and I'm an Eastern geopolitician. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. On the subject uh, to begin with of uh, Mr. Mr. Dugan, who I have met actually, I was on the television program with him in Russia in the days when uh, <coughs> Russia's idea of soft power was to even let people like me on television. This was a long time ago. It was very brief, but uh, but but there was such an episode, and. Uh, I think it's important to, bear, to, to the, the fundamental thing to, to bear in mind is that the fall of the Soviet Union and loss uh, in the minds of many Russian people of these vast territories that used to be under the control of Moscow was uh, something that uh, for many people was very difficult to accept and uh, very difficult to regard as absolutely final. And even Putin himself, at, in, in the early 90s, in uh, meetings which were attended by Western academics, uh, stood up and spoke about the need to defend Russian speakers or the need to defend ethnic Russians. Uh, in the early years of the, of the Yeltsin period, one of the most constant complaints uh, before United Nations Human Rights uh, tribunals on the part of the Russian authorities was the abuse of the ethnic Russians in Estonia and Latvia. Uh, the defense of ethnic Russians, the defense of, eth of Russian speakers was developed early on as uh, an idea that might, that might justify future aggression. In the early 1990s or even in, throughout the 1990s when Russia itself was in chaos, there was not much they could do with those ideas, but they were repeated, and they were never completely uh, uh, abandoned. Uh, and of course, as Russia became more powerful, they uh, they could be used to to uh, to justify aggression, and aggression was uh, ultimately necessary uh, because. 
uh, it was the one thing that would appeal to people's emotions in Russia. It would be the one thing that would make people forget about the corruption and the stealing and the way in which they were being exploited. The, in 1999, when the apartment bombings were blown up in Moscow, uh, a complete change in the psychology of the Russian people took place. Up until that time, it was assumed that the coming elections in 2000 would be an opportunity at last to settle accounts with those people who had pillaged the country. Once uh, Russians were blown up in their own homes uh, and, the, and by, supposedly by Chechen terrorists, all of the aggression was redirected from those people who had stolen the country's wealth toward the Chechens. And the country was massively distracted. And that process is, is, is that mechanism is at work today as well. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in my view, uh, the, the, the war in Ukraine is an effort to distract the Russian population from the real meaning of the Ukrainian events. And in the, in the, in the interest, it, it's a, it works because people have not fully accepted the, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of empire. There are many people who, who, who have a nostalgic longing for lost glory. So therefore, this is in effect a button that the authorities can push. But it, the, 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 the use of this opportunity, the use of this possibility, is extremely opportunistic. And the use of people like Dugan, and even the Russian Orthodox Church, who, who, I, who justify this, and can be seen to justify it, is also extremely opportunistic. And the whole theory of, of the Russian world is similarly opportunistic. It's uh, the means by which a small group is able to manipulate, first of all, the Russian population, and second of all, uh, is able to uh, ju justify its actions, however, however falsely, in the eyes of the outside world. So I would not take any of the, any of the, uh, there's a question of sincerity, and I think it's a mistake to take anything that the present Russian leadership says at face value, and to, it's a mistake even to think of it as, as a sincere expression of belief, rather than as a means by which they hope, they, 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 one, of, one of the many means that they employ to, to hold on to power. Uh, on the subject of the European Union, and of course by the European Union we mean, I guess, also the West and the United States as well. I'm, I'm an American citizen. Uh, and so I follow what goes on in America more than I follow what goes on in European, within European Union. But uh, the, the, if the, uh, my perspective on all this is uh, that the real, the real battleground is the Russian people themselves. Because the policies that are being pursued, a, a country that is as corrupt and as uh, uh, lawless as Russia uh, it is programmed toward an eventual systemic crisis. And it's important that the people of Russia start to understand the sources of their problems, something which is very difficult for them to understand, and which all of this propaganda conceals from them. So, the important thing from my point of view is that the European Union and the United States act in a way that they can make clear to the Russian people the, 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 the falseness on the one hand of what they're being told and the determination on the other hand of the West to resist it and to act on honest principles. And therefore, they shouldn't make any, in a general terms, they should not make concessions to the Russian understanding of reality. 
There should not be things like a reset policy, which suggest that it was America's fault that there were problems in relations. We should not be afraid to talk about all the crimes that were committed by the Russian regime. We should not be afraid to arm those who are resisting aggression. Uh, under those circumstances, uh, I think that would not only strengthen the countries that are, might be faced with Russian aggression, but also deliver a message ultimately to the Russian people themselves. Thank you, David. And go ahead. Let me address the first question. Uh, the question was, uh, what is the uh, place or position of Georgia in this uh, Russian Soul Power Games? I think the Georgian case is uh, really interesting uh, in many case, many sense. One of the um, uh, one of the angle of this is that um, it, it's really interesting for post-Soviet countries how Georgia and Russia will manage to uh, normalize uh, their relations. A few days ago, my Ukrainian friend actually uh, he was reading Georgian news uh, regarding Georgian Russian relations and about these pro-Russian groups. And he was wondering how they could, uh, how could actually people, uh, the Georgian people, could have this kind of ideas after this brutal war of 2008. And he was astonished uh, because um, at least right now it is impossible to think that, that, that you know Ukrainians and Russians can, you know, speak about the normalization. At least the emotions are so high. For so in that sense, Georgian case is very interesting for post-Soviet space and uh, Russian uh, authorities they also understand. That they, what they're trying is they trying to show that you know after that even the Georgia-Russian war uh, they can manage relations with uh, Georgia and there's just some kind of, I would say illusion from both sides um, there's illusion from Russian side that you know after the change of government uh, they can persuade the new government to have to be to have more I would say Russian neutral policy. And then, in the long run, uh, you know, to uh, to have more, um, uh, you know, active policies for the economic and trade, and invest more in Georgia, and they think that uh, the economy can pull up the politics as well. So that that's uh, the vision, at least you see it from Moscow. And at the same time, there is uh, some kind of illusion from Georgian side, and Felicity thinks that you know, if you improve these relations with, uh, with under the banner of this normalization policy with Russia. So Russia may come to this its sense, and it may revise its, uh, you know, like recognition of to, uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, which is not going to happen. Not because uh, even 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 Mr. Putin, if he decides, if he wants to, he cannot. And one of the reasons is that, as you know, the great power, uh, every great power, they have uh, their, um, uh, I would say. Uh, um, the, the great power cannot really uh, renounce its, uh, you know, like recognition of the uh, territory, and uh, we know a lot of uh, cases from the history, uh, and this is about the prestige of the great power, and we know the case uh, from, for, for, for instance, from the Panama when uh, it was actually taken out from the Colombia. So I think in that sense, um, uh, the Georgian leadership still uh, thinks that this normaliz uh, I mean, the normalization thing can bring some kind of you know, change in the policy. But right now, we see that we're witnessing the situation between Russia and Georgia, when actually both sides, I think they reached the, uh, the uh, point when they understand that it's very difficult to move on, uh, especially um, this, uh, uh, when they're touching the so-called red lines. And I think uh, that's a dilemma from uh, both sides. Uh, but I think in general, uh, this case would be very interesting for Ukrainians, for Moldovans, and for other um, uh, Post-Soviet countries, and uh, uh, another question was um, about how George. Uh, there was something else. Uh, uh, what, what kind of uh, success uh, Russia had with so using so far? I think the great success they had um, already in the Abkhazian South Ossetia. Unfortunately, we cannot do much also with the um, uh, national minorities, and uh, if you look to the. Uh, you know what kind of television uh, and uh, news uh, that these people watch. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a, a Russian language is still lingua franca for our national minorities. Even when we speak with the Azeri or Armenian minorities, we uh, interact with them with Russian. Georgian state, unfortunately, still did not really offer any meaningful programs. There, there, there were several attempts, and at least uh, we have few cases. Uh, I'm. Uh, 
teaching at the university. And uh, fortunately, we have now new generation of the uh, national uh, students from the national minorities who actually speak the Georgian. But this is just started, so it takes some time, and uh, we will need probably several years until uh, the, we will solve this problem. And they are also very successful with uh, <coughs> in, uh, with political groups, and uh, most of you, you know, these uh, groups who are. Maybe not directly, uh, you know, like voicing the pro-Russian uh, instances, but sometimes they uh, bringing ideas like the neutrality of Georgia and some other things, uh, which is very closely, in, uh, which uh, sounds like music for uh, Kremlin, uh, because we know how they um, how they respect the neutrality, and we know the example of the Moldova, uh, which uh, is officially a neutral country as well, and also Ukraine. So I think in that sense, uh, this is a typical example. Thank you, Robin. Ladies and gentlemen, so we have to stop here because uh, our time is limited. That's sorry, uh, but I hope we will have time for uh, an official discussion. So let me thanks to our speaker uh, for the interesting presentation. Thank you. And our organizers, my thanks so much for such an important and interesting event. Thank you all, and thank you to our translators. Uh, and hopefully, the House of Europe will be in the future at some such kind of important discussion.